For the next lesson in our evolution unit, we're going to be looking at speciation. And in order to talk about speciation, which is the formation of a new species, we first have to define what a species is. And biologists have actually been arguing over this for over 200 years, and I'm still not sure they've decided. But there are a few different definitions. So the first one, or one of them, is the morphological definition. And this is that a species is a type of living organism with fixed characteristics which distinguish it from other species. So a species, basically, if you look alike, you're part of the same species, is the idea. But that definition doesn't recognize the fact that the species can evolve. It says they have fixed characteristics. So there's that problem with that one. Then there's the biological definition, which is that a species is a group of actually, or potentially, interbreeding populations which can produce fertile offspring and have a common gene pool. So basically that one says you're part of the same species if you can breed together and make fertile offspring. And that's the one we mostly focus on is the biological definition. But there are some issues with defining a species. So there are what are called many sibling species. They cannot interbreed, but they don't look any different. They look almost the same. So it's difficult to identify that they are different species. Right? So they're, they're defined as different species due to the biological definition, but not the morphological definition. There's some pairs of species that are clearly very different in their characteristics. They look very different, but they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. A major issue is that some species reproduce asexually. I mean, they don't interbreed at all. So the biological species definition is totally unusable in the case of things like bacteria. And finally, with fossils, you can't classify them according to the biological species definition because it's impossible to decide with which organisms they would have been able to interbreed, right? They're not alive, so you can't tell if they're able to interbreed with a certain group, right? So there are some, some difficulties with defining a species, but we're getting there. So now let's talk about speciation. So speciation is the evolutionary formation of new species. When a population is isolated from the remainder of its species, the isolated population will gradually diverge from the rest of the species if natural selection is acting differently on it. So if a species gets divided in two and they have different environmental factors acting on them, they're going to evolve differently and they're going to start to become different from each other. And eventually, those two populations are not going to be able to interbreed anymore. And when that happens, it, they are said to be reproductively isolated from each other. And as a result, a new species is created. And so this is macroevolution, right? We talked about microevolution. Now we're talking about macro. So we're creating a whole new species, not just having changes in frequencies of alleles within a species. So how can this happen? So speciation can be either what's called allopatric or sympatric. So allopatric speciation is the evolution of populations into separate species as a result of a geographical barrier. So some sort of geographical barrier, a river, a lake, a mountain, has separated these uh, group of species and then they evolve separately and they become new species. Sympatric speciation is the evolution of populations into separate species within the same geographic area. Okay, so they're still in the same area, but there's something else that has caused them to be separated from each other, and we'll talk about those ways in a little bit, that has then caused them to become a new species. So in order to become a new species, the population needs to be reproductively isolated from the rest of the species. So how can that happen? 
So there are many behavioral, structural, or biochemical traits that are going to prevent individuals of different species from reproducing successfully together. And so these biological barriers to, to reproduction can be either prezygotic or postzygotic. So prezygotic meaning they stop the formation of a zygote. So something prevents those two organisms from creating a zygote together. Sperm and egg are not fusing. Or there could be postzygotic barriers where the zygote does form, but then something happens after that so that the organism doesn't develop, doesn't survive. So let's look at the prezygotic isolating mechanisms. So these are going to either prevent mating, like the action of mating, or they're going to prevent fertilization, the sperm and the egg joining together. So prevention of mating can occur in a few different ways. So the first one is ecological, or also called habitat isolation. So basically this is the species are in different habitats. They don't encounter each other, so they can't reproduce, right? Fish in the water, bird in the sky. They can't reproduce. They don't encounter each other for the most part. Next one is temporal isolation or temporal isolation. Um, the species reproductive cycles occur at different times. So a certain organism might breed in the spring and the other one breeds in the fall. So they're not going to be able to breed together. The next one is behavioral isolation. So one species has a distinct mating ritual and it doesn't attract members of another species. So they're not going to get together. So that was prevention of mating. So then if mating actually does occur between the two organisms, there are methods that can prevent fertilization. So one of them is mechanical isolation. So there are structural differences in reproductive organs. So the organisms are trying to mate, but the pieces don't fit together properly. And then the next one is gametic isolation. So uh, the pieces fit, but then when the sperm gets to the egg, they don't fuse, right? They, they don't have the right genetic markers that say, oh yeah, I'm allowed to fuse with you or whatever the case may be. So they don't fuse to form a zygote. So that just summarizes the prezygotic isolation mechanisms. You have habitat isolation. They live in different places. Temporal isolation. They breed at different times. Behavioral isolation. So with birds, right, a certain song that they use to attract a mate isn't going to attract a different species. Mechanical isolation. Uh, the parts don't fit together. And then gametic isolation. The sperm and the egg just don't want to fuse. So then we have the post-zygotic isolating mechanisms. So this is the zygote has formed, but now something prevents them from making a healthy hybrid organism that can reproduce. So it might prevent the hybrid zygote from maturing, or if the hybrid does, uh, live, then it's unable to reproduce. So the first mechanism is hybrid inviability. So the hybrid, the zygote forms, but then the hybrid embryo dies early in development or shortly after birth, right? It's just, it's not viable. It can't survive. There's too much wrong with it. The next one is hybrid infertility. So there are some hybrids that become strong and fit adults but they are likely to be infertile and unable to undergo meiosis because of uh, chromosome number issues. And then the last one is hybrid breakdown. So sometimes if the two species that created the hybrid are quite similar, um, have similar numbers of chromosomes, for example, the first generation hybrids might be fertile, but then their offspring don't develop properly at all. So it can't, uh, the lineage can't be propagated any further. 
So a common example is that of a mule, right? So a mule results from a cross between a horse and a donkey. And so a mule is a hybrid, and so, but a mule cannot reproduce. One mule with another mule can't make a baby mule. And the reason in this case is because of chromosome number. So a horse has uh, 32 chromosomes, which are duplicated, so 64 chromosomes, and a 2N of 64, and then in the gametes, 32. The donkey has a 2N number of 62, which means after it goes through meiosis, there are 31 chromosomes. So when the sperm and egg come together to make a mule, this mule has 63 chromosomes. And so that can't be divided in half. You can't just chop a chromosome in half. So the mule cannot undergo meiosis because it, it's just not going to work. And so the mule will not be able to reproduce. So speciation often happens repeatedly to form a group of species from one ancestral species. You have one species and it then breaks off and makes more species. And so divergent evolution is a process by which species that were once similar to an ancestral species have become increasingly different because they've been subjected to different environmental pressures. Okay, so this occurs when populations change as they adapt to different environmental conditions. If species in a group diverge rapidly, so it sort of happens quickly, there's an ancestral species and then all of a sudden there's a whole bunch more species, um, all of a sudden in a relative way, uh, it's called adaptive radiation. So this can happen when due to competition, the group must find new opportunities that would present less competition and allow them and their genome to be continued. So one of the major examples of adaptive radiation uh, comes from Galapagos finches, and a lot of Darwin studies were on these finches. And so the idea, or what he found, was that there was uh, a finch ancestor and when the finches were forced to compete with each other for food and there weren't enough seeds, right, because the ancestor ate seeds, they had to evolve in order to eat different types of food in order to survive. And so that happened and that created a whole bunch of different species of finch eating different things. And so that's what's called adaptive radiation. So that was divergent evolution. Convergent evolution is a process by which two or more unrelated species become increasingly similar in phenotype in response to similar selective pressures. So what this diagram is showing you is you've got the um, marsupial mammals and then the uh, mammals like the ma ha that have mammary glands. Um, so in different areas of the world, and you can see that even though they can't, they're completely different areas of the world, they've, they've evolved because they need to survive in similar environments, right? So if you look at the marsupial mole and then what would be our mole, they, they don't actually have a common ancestor, but they look very similar because they filled a niche in the environment uh, in a similar way. And then finally, there's coevolution, and this is a process in which two species of organisms that are tightly linked evolve together. And so examples of organisms that influence each other's evolution, so predators and prey, are going to evolve with each other. Pollinators and plants, and parasites and hosts. So the diagram shows the pollinators and the plants, and we looked in an example of this in our another lesson, right? The length of the flower or the, the tube that the pollinator needs to reach into to get the nectar evolves with the length of the beak or the tongue of the pollinator. So 
That's how speciation occurs, which remember this is macro evolution. So we're talking on a bigger scale. We're forming whole new species. So we have to, the populations need to become reproductively isolated in various different ways in order to create a new species.